If you're not familiar with the Downtown Dialogue series, we uh, are the Downtown Spokane Partnership is uh, started this in last winter really as an effort to re-engage in uh, public conversations and take on topics like this so that we make sure that we're addressing the issues that are important to you, uh, to our community members, as well as um, hopefully learning and walking away with some next steps and uh, helping us to advance our policy uh, approach as a result of these conversations. So they're very helpful for us and we hope that you learn something along the way. Today, of course, we're here to talk about parking. Um, a few of the things that we talked about as staff uh, that we wanted to try to walk away with today and hope that you walk away with is first we wanted to pr provide the the city was kind enough to commission and fund a comprehensive parking study uh, for the parking district and um, so we wanted to give you a little glimpse into the summary of that study and Andrew will um, approach that and uh, try to give you an update or a brief on that study there it is a, a pretty in-depth study so I think we have some copies laying around here and you certainly have access to it through the City of Spokane's website. Uh, we also wanted to engage our panelists as well as you in some of the challenges and conundrums as the title indicates around parking and then again hopefully uh, as always is our goal is to walk away with some next steps and have you walk away really kind of contemplating on some things about maybe how you can get involved in being a part of the solution whether that's uh, the messaging how you communicate if you're a property manager how do you communicate around parking if it's uh, partnerships what kind of partnerships might you explore as a result of some of the things that we talk about and some of the challenges or gaps as well as perhaps your own personal investment whether that's whether that's in, in a you know, parking infrastructure or whether that's uh, a parking facility that you manage, maybe looking at the technology and, and seeing the importance of upgrading the technology around that facility and or the lighting, for instance, to make sure that it's more inviting for your customers. So I want to make sure that we give a, a sincere thanks to our vendors. We have uh, in the back, if you haven't uh, taken the time, I know we're going to have a good social interaction period after this is over, but I want to make sure that we uh, do take the time to identify Avista is kind enough to be here. We have Spot Hero who has traveled here from Seattle uh, to share with us some, uh, some technology, I think, aspects that you could consider. Uh, Avista, we've been partnering with uh, Doug and Avista to, to, and working with private property owners on how you can and convert some of your lighting into uh, to LED, so enhancing the public safety and the appearance of safety uh, for, for uh, much less money than you might think because of the Avista rebate program. So we want to thank Avista for that. Of course, we have um, uh, LimePod. Uh, I can't quite read this. Um, Sorry, uh, but um, Lime, and uh, we're, we're excited about the fact that Lime has just been uh, selected as the city's vendor again. So going forward, this I think is a more of a permanent contract. Last year we had a pilot with the Lime bikes and the scooters. So not only are they bringing uh, the Lime scooters and bikes back, but uh, they also have a pilot that they're working on in Seattle with, with, uh, with vehicles. So uh, we'll be curiously watching that. And then off to the left here, we have a couple of our ambassadors. If you haven't met our ambassador team, they're walking around in downtown uh, dressed in the cobalt blue and uh, the reason I have them here today is because we have two of them that have been trained in what's called SEPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. And that's uh, one of the ways that we can partner with you as, as a tenant or a property owner to help you kind of see your landscape and your property uh, through the eyes essentially of a criminal, make sure that you are creating a more uh, safer environment and uh, make sure that it's safer again for your customers and your, and your um, staff. So uh, to, to to us, why why is that relevant to this? Because one of the things that uh, the study is going to tell us is that there are, there are a uh, there is a reasonable amount of parking in certain areas of the parking district that is still available even during peak time. Uh, but we know that some of the challenges around that has to do with safety and the perception of safety and getting back and forth to those parking locations. And so, whether it's your building or the walk along that way or the parking facilities, uh, we can help you in, in doing an, a, a personal assessment of your property and giving you some counseling on things that you might be able to do uh, in order to improve that safety. So. Um, Finally, I want to thank our panelists. We have a great group of panelists, and we are uh, very fortunate and blessed to have Paul Reed, the publisher of the Journal of Business, as our moderator today. Uh, as uh, Paul doesn't really need an introduction, but as you know, Paul took over the publisher job uh, not too long ago and has been with the journal, I think, over 25 years, uh, to my knowledge. 
33 years. Um, uh, and uh, what I would say is the only uh, relevant business journal in Spokane. That's certainly my go-to. And if you haven't uh, subscribed to their weekly reports and their daily e-news, uh, it's really a must in order to stay ahead of the and stay ahead of the masses and keep yourself abreast of the current uh, issues that are going on. So, uh, so with that, um, our conversations and today's meeting. Uh, wouldn't be possible, frankly, without all of you. So we could have this great meeting and we could propose to have this conversation and engagement, but if you weren't here, it wouldn't take place. So whether you're a guest, whether you're a ratepayer, whether you're a member of ours, or whether you're one of our partners, like the municipal partners, again, a uh, big thanks from us to you for being here and for your uh, partnership uh, throughout uh, the downtown area with the Downtown Spokane Partnership. So uh, finally, I would just like to ask if you would please join me in giving a warm welcome to our moderator tonight, Mr. Paul Reed. Thank you, Mark. I gotta tell you, we owe some congratulations to uh, Downtown Spokane Partnership. Taking on homelessness was their last one. Parking this time, I don't know what's next time. They, they take all the easy stuff, right? All the easy things for us to deal with. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and thanks for all of you being here. It warms my heart that folks will take time, especially at the end of a business day, to talk about the things that impact our city. And it, 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 it makes, uh, makes me have great confidence in where we're going in the future. So uh, why are we here? We're here because uh, downtowns um, are critical to an economy, right? A, a vital downtown is critical to the economy. We cannot have a vital county or MSA without a, a healthy and vibrant downtown. And in turn, parking is a critical piece of a downtown. And the things that we do, the investments we make, the decisions we make uh, surrounding parking can positively and negatively impact the health of our downtown and therefore the economy. So we have to be here. We have to be having these conversations. So thank you for doing that. Uh, here's how this is going to go. Uh, we're going to uh, allow our, our fine panelists to um, self-introduce and to say just one brief thing about um, really in the context of parking, just to kind of set the tone for the evening. Uh, this is, is going to go really fast kind of popcornish, so so we're going to have to uh, uh, move quickly through the, the presentations, and uh, and we've got a lot of questions. DSP was very uh, smart in asking for questions in advance of their membership. We got a lot of them. We're not going to get to all of them tonight, but I'm assured that your questions will be answered uh, by DSP, if not tonight, then in the coming weeks. Uh, so let's get right to it. Um, I'd like to um, ask each of you to um, self-introduce and uh, just make an opening comment about parking. So we'll start with you, Gavin. Thanks. It's amazing to me, uh, this parking discussion, because it has a really long tail. We've been talking about this for a really long time. I, I think I shared the the BID back in the 90s, and we brought um, Dave Fian over from the International Downtown Association to talk about these very topics. And I think if you made a bullet point listing of all these uh, things we're talking about tonight, we were talking about many of those things back then. Um, in many respects, I think we'd be doing cartwheels to see where we are today versus where we were at that particular point in time with parking and downtown and the downtown area in general. But a lot of these are the same topics, and so I think it's a, a great to see us kind of moving it forward uh, with those topics, but also maybe hopefully talking about some new approaches to how we can get things done here. So glad to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Brandon Repez Betty. I'm the Director of Communications and Customer Service at Spokane Transit. I'm here today to provide some perspective on, on transit and how it's a, a part of the toolkit that we use in our downtown. Uh, focus on the word tool. It is one tool in a kit of, uh, in a kit of parts that uh, we use as an entire strategy to address how people get in and out of downtown. Um, a lot of our approach is about congestion mitigation. How do we get lots of people into downtown without clogging up the streets, without clogging up parking? Uh, and it's an option, right? There's a lot of tools in the kit, and, and we're looking to the people who are looking for transit as an option. So uh, we want to highlight how we're uh, improving access to service, uh, how we're in incentivizing uh, programs like our employer-sponsored bus pass program and our universal transit access pass program to, to get people to use the bus when it's convenient for them, and also uh, how we're trying to make transit more convenient and more comfortable by providing better passenger amenities uh, and 
making it an easier trip with reliable real-time information. We think those, that's a good combination for our approach to how we can help out in downtown. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. My name is Roy Kogan. Um, I'm a partner in the law firm of Q-Tuck Rock. I'm a bond lawyer, and we were involved in the River Park Square parking garage from day one. <laughs> <laughs> just get it out. There. Yeah, just amazing. <laughs> and, and, and it's a project that we're actually very, very proud of. <laughs> Hi, my name is Melissa Verwest. I'm a technical sales engineer for Old Castle Infrastructure, but my um, background is structural engineering. So I sit here today to kind of provide options for using precast and putting um, those materials to use in a way that maybe doesn't look like it pencils out first, but there are a lot of advantages um, to using a pre-manufactured product for maybe looking at a structure as a possibility. Um, the other part of it is I commuted downtown for over seven years for um, when I work downtown and I've really seen a lot of change, good and bad, and so have a little bit perspective, a good perspective on being a bike commuter to our downtown core. Thank you. Hi, my name's Dan Geiger. Uh, when Mark asked me to be on this panel, I said, I don't think anyone really wants to hear from a parking guy uh, from Diamond Parking, but, but here I am. Um, I'll say this, uh, I've been in the parking business since I was 16 years old, and it's all I've ever done, so I do have a unique perspective on it, and I know a little bit about it, um, but it, today we hope to have an open discussion, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to fire away, and, and we'll try to answer them. We all have different perspectives that we're coming from. She evidently knows how to build a structure. I just know how to run them and maybe provide the land that's under them. But anyway, the other thing I'll mention is um, I'm a Spokane native, and I went to high school with that guy on the end and college with the moderator. So I, I feel right at home here in Spokane. <laughs> It's a class reunion, Dan. Um, well, good evening. I'm Andrew Rawls. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy and Parking at the Downtown Spokane Partnership. And tonight, I'm, I'm looking forward to presenting, uh, 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 raising the visibility on, on a study that the city just released on parking. And uh, my comments will focus mainly on two things. The first is the uh, uh, very detailed snapshot that the consultants gathered on uh, use of parking across the downtown core, actually across greater downtown. So that's the first part. And then. Uh, a whole series of strategies, 20 actually, I'm not going to get into every single one, but uh, very innovative strategies that I think will do a lot of good uh, for uh, downtown. And um, you know, over time, will help to relieve uh, the frustration that I think uh, a lot of people here in the room are experiencing, and anybody that, that works in downtown, it's of course a classic sign of a growing downtown when, um, when parking and transportation gets to the level of frustration. And uh, the parking study comes at a good time because it, it uh, provides a a very detailed roadmap forward to help us overcome uh, where we're at right now, which I think is pretty average for downtown, uh, and then over the next six years or so kind of get ahead of the pack so that uh, parking and transportation isn't a bottleneck but is, is a real um, uh, attractor. Thank you. So hang on to that mic because I'm going to come right back to you. But, uh, okay. So we're going to have Andrew spend about 10 minutes, and he's going to give us a, just a straight up debrief. What was in the study itself? Uh, and after that, I'm going to ask for some uh, impressions, first impressions about the study from our panelists. Uh, then we're going to move into some discussion about, uh, about solutions. And, uh, and then we'll la hopefully spend about 15, 20 minutes at the end, if, as time permits, uh, with your questions. Uh, and on your tables, you will find uh, white cards and a pen. And so if you have a question that comes to you uh, during this uh, event, just write it down, hold up your hand, and uh, Kelly will come by and pick it up from you, and we'll try to get as many questions answered as we can. We won't get to everything, but we're going to give it a shot. So with that, Andrew, uh, debrief us. Yes, debrief. All right. Uh, well, thank you. Um, Mark mentioned that this was a, a comprehensive parking study. Uh, it, it, uh, that's almost an understatement. It, it's the most comprehensive parking study and transportation study the city has undertaken for downtown. It is, of course, focused on, on parking particularly, uh, but it, uh, it is 
uh, a, a document that came to 89 pages. The addendum weighed in at 256 pages, so it's a lot of ground to cover. And it's intended, as I mentioned, to cover six years of development for uh, the next six years of, of parking development in downtown. Uh, it is built in part on a, very, uh, a series of very detailed surveys that were conducted by the consultant of parking use and turnover across the, uh, across the well, greater downtown. Uh, and that is a very large swath of land. It covers, as you can see from the, the heat map here, the North Bank. It uh, covers the county campus, the, of course, the downtown core, uh, the West End, and then South Downtown, and reaches all the way up to the hospital district. So uh, if you were to take all of that together, uh, it comes to the, the average peak use for that entire area comes to 56%. But uh, in such a large area, that, that's not uh, an easy number to really to reconcile uh, in, in terms of the demand. And the parking study, uh, the consultants rather, of course, uh, went into much greater detail and um, focused in on the eight zones, uh, actually make that nine zones you see here. Uh, the most uh, heavily used of those zones were, not surprisingly, uh, the downtown core and then the hospital district. Uh, and both of those district, district, districts reached uh, peak use um, at noon and then on into the early evening in the downtown core of the, mid, uh, of the lower to mid 70s. Uh, since the industry standard for a fully utilized parking facility is 85% or more, the consultant has assembled uh, 20 mutually supporting strategies. Um, they're distinct but, but mutually supporting that will, if fully implemented, allow for a much more efficient use of existing parking facilities uh, on a, and off street. Uh, in, the, um, in their expert opinion, uh, there is still, in spite of how challenging the, le the parking lease market is, uh, available parking stock in existing facilities. And due to how expensive it is uh, to develop parking garages, and they note the industry average of $20,000 per stall to build, uh, to build a, a parking garage, um, they recommend a strategy that's really focused on increasing the overall use rather than building new supply. Uh, it's important to qualify that by saying that uh, it's not recommending against the development of parking garages. It's simply saying that uh, given uh, the city's resources and allotment of time, uh, it can, uh, the city can make the most of focusing on uh, the use of existing uh, parking stock and making that more efficient than it is currently. So those are the overall themes that I wanted to focus on. I'm, I'm going to get into, uh, for the next couple, of, a few minutes, uh, some of the individual strategies. Uh, I'm just going to brief that. Um, I think uh, you'll find uh, quite a few of these are, are definitely things that we're not doing, and, and they're, uh, they're quite innovative. Um, leading off with the uh, overall theme of uh, maximizing use of existing supply. Uh, the study, uh, the consultants very quickly noted that there's a substantial gap between the rates for on and off street parking. Uh, on street parking is a uh, buck 20 per hour in the downtown core and off street parking facilities are charging $2 and more per hour in their facilities. They noted of course that that uh, leads to uh, significant demand for on street. And, and you know, once, of course they obviously noted that that creates actual uh, you know, driving in downtown, it leads to congestion because people are uh, people favor uh, because of the pricing signal uh, on street. So they recommend that uh, an early step should be to to raise uh, off on street parking so that uh, employee parking and other uh, sorts of parking that goes on that you you generally don't want your on street to provide moves into the garages. Uh, it also recommends some changes and adjustments to. Um, Time stays. It suggests that uh, two-hour meters remain as the standard in the downtown core, but um, some adjustments be made. For instance, uh, two-hour meters in West Downtown be shifted over, over to four hours. Uh, similar, similarly, in the county campus and East Downtown. Um, you know, they, they definitely uh, heard a lot of uh, desire on the part of uh, many people, uh, employees, and visitors to make uh, a two-hour or make parking or, or extend time days for parking, and they su suggested that there's a way to do that um, for, uh, for parking spaces that are currently limited to two hours. Uh, they're recommending a tiered parking structures that would allow people to park on street for three, maybe even four hours if they're willing to pay a higher rate so that they're still fostering turnover um, and, and getting the actual value out of those spaces. 
Um, they provide a very interesting idea. It's, a, it's called a shared use parking program, and that's where property owners and managers who have generally underutilized parking spaces make those spaces available at, at times that the owners uh, you know, want them uh, in circulation. Uh, and they do that through an online parking, uh, interactive parking map or, or an app. Uh, the second type of shared use parking that they talk about is one that's geared toward downtown workers who are here in the evening, and that's going to be generally uh, bar workers, restaurant workers, uh, and they would uh, facilitate a, a uh, access to particularly to parking garages and, and on street, or excuse me, to parking lots in which uh, uh, those workers can get access to those facilities because they're open, because those facilities really serve um, uh, daytime workers. Uh, a lot of material on multimodal transportation, um, and uh, I think uh, some interesting ideas around how to manage curb space. So there's a lot of demand for curb space, uh, commercial loading zones. Uh, they uh, have provided some recommendations on how to manage that as efficiently as possible, and, and basically to survey what it's being used for at the moment. If there was a taxi zone that served a, a restaurant that no longer is there and that's been replaced by uh, an office, for instance, just make the adjustment. Uh, and and some also, also some uh, additional recommendations on how to prior, uh, prioritize use of, of uh, uh, commercial loading zones. Um, they um, recommend the establishment of uh, event management policies. And this is interesting because uh, they noted that uh, events are, are a big driver of parking in downtown uh, and provided some details there that uh, if, uh, they recommended that on-street parking should have an event rate. Uh, they recommend that uh, the city partner with SDA to provide uh, additional park and ride uh, uh, shuttles for major events. SDA is already doing that, but, but just an expansion of that. And then uh, establish uh, on-street passenger loading and unloading and other uh, uh, standard um, metering during, uh, during non-event hours. All right. Uh, they recommend a uh, interesting program. It's, uh, they call it a universal valet program. Uh, and that is where um, commercial loading zones in the downtown core that, uh, that are used as CLZs during the daytime uh, could, uh, or you know, other just standard parking stalls could be uh, in the afternoon and on into the evening as demand declines a bit, could be handed over to a contractor with a city who uh, sets that up as a valet program. Uh, you drive up to the valet, hand your key over, and that valet is going to then take your car over to wherever parking is available, whether that's at the parkade or a diamond lot. And then you send your, your, uh, your text and your app, and then they'll retrieve it and bring it back to you. Uh, lots of recommendations on the internal management of the uh, parking enforcement uh, program, both uh, equipment and uh, the personnel who provide that service. And then uh, getting on toward the end here, uh, lots of material on branding and wayfinding. Uh, they recommend establishing a, a standard brand for parking, uh, one that covers the on and off street uh, parking. Uh, Diamond, for instance, has done, done that uh, over the past uh, couple of years, really, with the transition over to the white P on blue background. But uh, they're recommending an expansion of that program. And then also to provide uh, consistent wayfinding. Um, and uh, active wayfinding, actually, where uh, parking facilities are showing the amount of parking that's available through uh, uh, a, a message board. Um, and similar uh, sorts of wayfinding and, and, uh, and uh, active parking wayfinding that's presented as an app as well. Uh, they recommend uh, unifying uh, the parking payment system. Um, so Passport is the app that you can pay for on-street parking. Uh, Diamond, again, just uh, over the past, I think, a few months, uh, pulled that into their system so that you can uh, use that same app to pay for parking in their, uh, in their facilities. They're recommending that be expanded. Uh, a number of zoning changes and uh, a significant amount of uh, material on what they call transportation demand management. Um, these are techniques that are designed to reduce personal vehicle parking requirements in the core. Uh, they incentivize shared parking development. In other words, parking garages that aren't built necessarily just for one facility, but might cover an entire district. Uh, they suggest, for instance, that uh, Zipcar or LimePod uh, and, and other similar companies uh, be provided space in existing facilities, uh, and that uh, bicycle parking facilities extended just beyond bike parking where you're locking your bike up to, to a pole or something, but that uh, even bike maintenance facilities be, be provided and incentivized through uh, private development. 
Um, there's an interesting uh, piece toward the end, uh, and they call it a established, well, they call it a parking and loo fund. Uh, these, it, it, it's a, a version of, um, um, excuse me, it, it's, uh, what was the term? Uh, impact fees. It's, it's a version of impact fees. However, uh, it would be drawn from a number of different revenue sources that would allow the city to uh, fund uh, trans transportation improvements. And this could go for wayfinding. It could go for bicycle facilities. It could. It doesn't say this in the study, but could it even uh, go to fund uh, additional uh, parking? in parking structures that are already going to be built. So for instance, if a private developer was going to build a, a 200 stall parking facility, uh, f these sorts of funds could be added so that the 200 stalls goes to 300. And the study closes with a final uh, couple of points. Um, one is to establish a transportation demand agency uh, to incent and incentivize development of uh, transportation demand management in downtown. And last but not least uh, is to um, expand multimodal transportation options. And this uh, in particular is to um, expand STA's offerings. So for instance, at the Jefferson lot, which primarily serves EWU stu students, uh, it, it suggests that you can expand that out and make that the, uh, the south side uh, version of what, uh, what we have at the North Bank uh, at the arena. Uh, so these are just a, a few of uh, a sizable array of, of recommendations that the study uh, covers, and uh, there's so much to it that, I, of course, I recommend that you, you check it out for yourself. Thank you. So show of hands, how many people read all of those pages in the, uh, in the parking study? Wow. <laughs> Bless your hearts. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was just going to praise Andrew for reading that, but thank you for doing it. I got about through one page 180, and I said, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, so, thank you. so so what we're going to do here is uh, I'm going to get some initial impressions uh, about what you just heard or if, if you've been through the study, what you learned from the study. And uh, we'll finish with you, Andrew, if you've got some comments, since that was kind of a straight up uh, description. So, Gavin, initial thoughts about the study. Thanks, Paul. The, um, the city participated directly in that coordinated study and put that together uh, along with the DSP. And so obviously uh, the city organization is very acquainted with it. City organization is uh, very engaged here. There are um, about five of us here right now that are directly involved in this study. So um, I think there's a ton of opportunity there. And um, if you look at the kind of the category of optimizing what we currently have, we probably have enough capacity in that system um, if there's agreement on how to approach it to do most of those things over time. I mean, there's a, uh, if you look at the pro formas and you talk about a repricing of the meters, the 15% the of the parking uh, inventory that's out there, and you talk about the repricing that's suggested in the parking study, that's probably going to create enough headroom to go out if you monetize those future revenue streams to go out and do a lot of what those recommendations are in terms of optimizing in terms of creating uh, comprehensive wayfinding. Uh, we've already got upgrades in the technology with the meters and the apps and those things built into the pro formas. Um, we have, uh, we're repricing citations also, as a lot of us probably know and even take advantage of. A citation in the city is probably less than an hour of parking in Seattle. And so uh, that, there'll be some repricing there also. So those kinds of things are, I think, within reach right now and that's probably really good news and so we need to have a, a quick dialogue about what that looks like and then just talk about how do we finance that within the current revenue streams as adjusted for what we're looking at in this parking study um the you know the heavy lift uh, gets back to a parking structure and we've got some experience with parking structures and the city's involvement in parking structures and Roy can speak to that also. Um, but I think there's a lot of ways, you know, these pro formas and we've taken a look, Andrew and I have taken a look at uh, a number of uh, proposals on parking structures and the pro formas are really close to balancing and they're closer today than they were a few months ago. The um, I think the inventory, Andrew, the most recently we, we had some space at the Davenport Grand which that's filled up now. So when you look at the, you know, obviously it's a demand kind of analysis and when it's, uh, when it's fu fully tapped, prices adjust. When the prices adjust, the pro forma is balanced and we're that close to those pro forma's balancing. So I would suggest that just adding to that 
economic base a little bit could be the tipping point, and you probably don't need to involve the government to do that. Um, there may be a subsidy available. I, um, I think the constitution of, or the, the composition of the um, legislature is a little more favorable right now to um, incentives than it has been in years past, and we've got great leadership over there. We have gotten incentives in the past. We got the lift legislation uh, a number of years ago where we received a portion of the state's sales tax, and that gave us uh, an annuity for 25 years of about 300,000 that allowed us to do the U District Bridge and improvements along the gate Division Street Gateway. Um, a similar incentive like that could be exactly what's needed to balance the books on a, a, a parking garage. Or the multifamily tax exemption that we have in the city right now, which is just um, keeping, you know, you're, you're not paying property tax for a period of time on the construction value for qualifying projects for multifamily. Well, if you extended that to a project or two on the east side of the Cascades for a parking garage, uh, for a, a larger parking garage project, the value of that incentive alone for a single project would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $3 million. Um, again, that would balance the pro forma in a hurry when you're already very, very close. So uh, I guess my reaction is that the, in terms of optimizing, we're, we're just about there already um, in terms of the plans that are in place and are being put in place. And in terms of a parking garage, I think there's a lot of opportunities also. I think one more I would mention is Probably, as opposed to direct involvement with the city or the county, you'd probably be looking at a public development authority. This is the approach we've been taking uh, in the city and the county now also with uh, 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 economic development. So you've seen the great success of the public development authority in the West Plains. You've seen the great success of the public development authority for the U District. Um, we're just about to move ahead. The council is deliberating right now on the finer details of the Northeast Public Development Authority. Uh, these are all public authorities with uh, great man, you know, with professional management and professional resources that are really moving a lot of things along. So uh, the mechanism for doing something with downtown parking might indeed be a downtown public development authority, which has already been discussed. And again, it would be a collaboration, I think, with the, uh, the city council, the administration, and, uh, and then the other folks that are working on this particular project. But again, I just see a lot of opportunity. Cool. Thank you, pass it on. So. Gavin's my friend, so I'll, I'll be gentle. If your story's too long, I'm a former editor and I will cut it off. <laughs> You're done. There we go. Sorry. We're going to come back to that. It's a great discussion. We're going to come back to the parking structure piece, but initial reactions about the study itself, briefly. When I first uh, dove into the study, uh, what I saw was a zero-sum game of parking. If one car is in a stall, another car can't be in the same stall. And so transit's best strategy in that game, our role, is to help get people out of the game if they want to. And that we can do that best by improving service. So. Uh, Voters in, the, in our region approved our 10-year plan in 2016, and we've been working hard at it since then to improve service uh, for those who want to take transit from their homes to downtown, which takes the car out of the equation. A great example is our September service change coming in this, later this year, uh, where we're improving service on the South Hill. There'll be a new commuter express route all the way from 57th and Regal area, uh, 57th and Palouse Highway, uh, and express service to downtown. Right now, the South Hill is the only geographic shed that doesn't have a, an express route, so we'll be implementing that. We'll also be implementing the Monroe Regal line, which will have frequent service all day long, every 15 minutes, and then every half hour on nights and weekends, which is a doubling of service on nights and weekends. Um, all that opportunity is for people to, to get downtown using public transit if, if it works for them. We're also trying to improve pass programs. So how can we create convenient-based pass models uh, so that people opt transit rather than driving their car into downtown? Uh, our program with Kendall Yards, uh, and Mr. Frank is here tonight, so I'm sure he, he wouldn't mind answering some questions for you later. Uh, but uh, that's a program that provides convenient base. So if you have a pass, you can hop on the bus and use it when you need, and you're paying on a per trip basis rather than on a per pass basis. Um, the last thing which we are so excited to finally celebrate would be the inclusion of the Central City Line in downtown. Just last week, we learned that uh, the allocation for $53 million in federal funding for that project uh, was, was dedicated to our project project here in Spokane, uh, we see that as a major element of how we can improve transit in downtown. Whether people are taking it from their homes and the high density residences, uh, residential neighborhoods around, whether they're 
connecting to it from other routes coming to downtown or lastly if they're just using it as a part of their trip so you park your car once in downtown when you get here and then you can ride the central city around the rest of the day for all of your other downtown needs uh, so those are all ways that we think that we can um, make a better tool in public transit to, to help downtown as part of parking um, thank you. Um, you know, I have read the study, and I think to some degree it misses the point on what Spokane needs. And I come at this, and we can talk about parking garages later, but I just want to follow the direction and talk about the study um, from a business owner. And when we, when we try to hire people, and when we were looking at office space, one of our criteria was do we have parking for our employees? And it's just not available. Um, there's waiting lists. Uh, that doesn't work very well. Uh, Spokane's not California. We have winters. We have employees trying to you know, dig their cars out of the snow and brush them off in the winter. So I do think there's a need for a downtown parking garage to serve businesses as they continue to grow and expand. <clears throat> and we can talk about parking garages in River Park Square later. Yeah, I'm going to build on that a little bit too. I guess my impressions of the study, looking at it from areas that I would have some um, some knowledge of, the parking structures, it was just kind of glazed over, as Andrew talked about, mainly because um, they didn't think that was sort of a viable option right now, or you needed the private investors, or whatever the reasons were. They were looking at other alternatives. But it didn't quite match with some of the questions we got from then fed from the DSP, where people have the impression of just like Roy said, we, we don't have the available space for people trying to come and work here. We don't have the available space, so that company took their business out of downtown because they needed more space. So I guess for me, the study in that area lacked a little bit of continuity with impressions of what the people working downtown and, and living downtown are actually faced with. So I think there was kind of a miss there. Um, as far as the biking, um, there's a lot on um, other options for getting to downtown and biking was one of them. Um, I read something where it said, okay, we got to try to implement some bigger lanes and do more of the share the road program. And I can tell you as a biker in Spokane, there's still a lot, a lot of folks that do not want to share the road with a biker. And I've, I've been bumper bumped and I've been yelled at to get off the road with some colorful language. Um, so not only do we need to provide those lanes and that access, but also signage saying, hey, we're a bike friendly town. There's, there's a share the road uh, mentality here, just so people are aware and not chasing the bikes off the road to make it unsafe for people to want to use a different mode of transportation. Thank you. Um, I read the, the study. It's very, very comprehensive, and I'll just cover a few of my initial impressions. Um, they said we should use more of the existing supply. That, that makes sense. There are some spaces that are unutilized. Um, they talked about evening monthly parking. Uh, that's something that, that would be fine if you want to sell a parking pass to someone who works downtown in the evening. Uh, the cost would be less than uh, a pass that you would sell that's good all day long. Um, they talk about a universal valet system where they valet park the cars. That, that didn't make any sense to me. Uh, it may work fine in Pasadena, but I, I can't see that working here in Spokane from, from my perspective. Uh, the wayfinding uh, signs are fine, the, although people don't always read the signs, but as, as you know, but they could be more clear. Um, and then um, the other thing that struck me was the and they plainly stated it in, in the study, the spaces on street that the city of Spokane owns, they're priced too low for how valuable they are. So, so in other words, the, the spaces in front of River Park Square as an example, they should be probably the most expensive spaces around. And my experience is people will pay to park as long as it's convenient and they can get a space. Now, some may disagree with, with me on that, but my experience is they'll pay if the space is available. So the, the study is correct that the on-street costs are too low. Um, and then the parking citations, uh, Gavin alluded to this a little bit. 
for $15, people don't have an incentive to, to pay the parking if it's going to cost them $12 or $13 all day There's there, to park at a meter. There's, there's not really an incentive to, to pay in the first place. So some adjustment on the citations makes sense. Um, and also, Gavin mentioned the pro formas are getting closer on building a garage, and, and I could see that because rates are going up in the, in the downtown core. Yeah, you know, my, my overall impression of the study uh, is complexity. It's, it's an incredibly in, uh, complex uh, series of recommendations, 20 as I mentioned. Um, but, you know, the, the thing that um, it, uh, it, it sort of speaks to um, is is that there is a, there's a policy environment around um, the development of parking um, that is rather particular to Washington State. So Idaho, by some respects, has it pretty easy. Uh, they've got tax room current financing that, that uh, we can't hold a candle to. Uh, it allows the state and the respective cities to uh, make public funds available to organizations like the Downtown Partnership uh, to, and, uh, to, to go ahead and, and then construct uh, parking facilities. So in, in particularly in Idaho, uh, and, and actually even interestingly in uh, Portland, uh, they, they went that route and, uh, and developed uh, quite a lot of parking stock. Uh, and this is a, a fairly common practice. It's done in Pittsburgh. It's done in Cincinnati. It's it's done all over the East Coast. But Washington State has a very interesting and and uh, rather frankly unfortunate uh, series of policies around uh, use of of public funds. In that it's hard to advance expected revenue through things like tax tax increment finance. So the the study doesn't get right uh, to addressing that directly. But it presents a whole series of options um, that the city can pursue. And it doesn't have to do all. Obviously, it can't do all at the same time, but over a period of six or more years, can roll these out so that the the level of frustration is is lowered. And I, I just don't foresee uh, a parking garage. I could be completely wrong, but I, I don't see how a parking garage gets developed in anything sooner than maybe a couple of years. I think the lead time on building a garage is, is possibly somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of years. So in the meantime, uh, the city and the, the business community really does need to be pursuing other strategies so that, that uh, we can all together add up to something that's uh, to, to a sum that is greater than the, uh, a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think the city does do, or the study does do a good job of presenting um, workable strategies. Uh, so we, we need to be focusing on, on those as well. We can, and it doesn't have to be either or, it's either the, strategy, the uh, study strategies or uh, parking facilities, it, it can actually be both. Well, thanks to all of you. So let's talk about parking structures. And Dan, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, so companies like yours are, are known for surface parking, right? And, yes. And so, uh, <laughs> why is that? From your perspective, uh, why is there an advantage in you pursuing uh, surface parking and not structured parking? What are the pros and cons from a company's point of view like yours? Well, people know us as surface parking lots because that's primarily what we have. We, we do operate parking garages too for other people, but we don't generally build them because they don't make financial sense. If, if they did, we would be doing that, but, but as a company that owns land and knows how to operate a parking garage, it, just for us it doesn't make sense to do it because the economics aren't there. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be done or a public-private partnership wouldn't work. I know Roy has some ideas on that, but does does that answer your question? Yeah. So yeah. So it uh, doesn't pencil out for you. Is what you're saying? Right. We're we're a pu purely market. You know. You know. The free market dictates what we do totally in terms of the rates we charge, in terms of what we're willing to invest in a property, and so we just don't build them. And a lot of people ask me, why don't you build a garage? Well, well, we would if it made sense, but it doesn't. We've bought a few on the courthouse steps from other people that have built them, but just generally we don't do it ourselves. Okay, so we're gonna circle back to that. Uh, first of all, uh, there's great food over here. I don't know if you've noticed that, and there is a bar here, so if you're hungry or thirsty, quietly go and, and please uh, take advantage of those things while we're working here. Uh, so uh, 
before we get to, and I'm going to go to Melissa here in a minute and talk about the economics of it, because we're, that's what you're talking about, is it's got to pencil out for this thing to make sense, uh, parking garage. But first I wanted to get to this uh, disconnect. Uh, and Melissa pointed it out that, that the parking study may suggest that there's plenty of capacity, right, in, in the downtown area. But the questions we got from you, some of you are brokers in the room, uh, is not true. And, uh, and in fact, I have a, I don't know whose this was, but it, uh, someone said there were five significant office deals in downtown Spokane of over 10,000 square feet. Three went to the Wonder Spokane, I'm assuming that's one on the north side of the, of the river, helped in part by the construction of a 400 car parking garage. One went to Wells Fargo Tower with 200 car parks, and the other went into the Lincoln Plaza with its underground parking. We have a parking crisis downtown that is affecting our ability to lease space. So uh, it's not the only one like that. We had quite a few questions like that. So how do these things, how, how does this disconnect happen? If, if the numbers show we're at 65, 75%, uh, is it, uh, it's not the right kind of parking? Is it, uh, is it a price issue? How do we get there? How do we get to this dichotomy? Anyone want to help? Well, well I will say this. We, as a downtown person, we don't want to lose business like that. I mean, it's any time that happens, it's not good. So I, I don't know if maybe people aren't calling the right person or, or what led to that. But, but we want the businesses downtown. and. I'll, to mention the Wonder Building up there, that's a perfect example of a developer that took that building and redid it, and he decided he needed parking, so he built a 394 stall parking garage there, and he built a little a little extra just for the future and for the neighborhood. So that's an example of of a private developer that took charge of it and handled the parking himself. So, Melissa, um, do you agree that they can't pencil out? Yeah, take us through the economics of building a structure. <laughs> well, being an engineer, I'd love to get my hands on the, uh, the equations and calculations that Dan, Dan uses, because uh, I think we could tweak them a little bit. Um, and I say that because uh, maybe initially these things don't pencil out, or you look at them and they're not penciling out. You, the study from, or the, the recent, what, what we read from Boise, or even in the study, it said 20000 to $40,000 a stall. and I believe here you probably can't do it for less than 15 a stall. But we're also seeing in Seattle where they're going for 100,000 a stall. And there's a lot to do with soils, locations, um, land contracts that are surrounding it. Um, you know, uh, what is that space going to be used for? Who is it servicing? So there's a lot of factors that go into that cost that then drive why it may not pencil out. But there are a few hidden gems with doing parking structures, and especially in particular precast structures, as far as you're using a, a better um, metric for speed. So you can definitely take your erection time and reduce it by 30% for the construction s schedule, which is pretty significant. You think about people out there and using, using the labor. You can also have these, these pieces are developed and produced on, in a plant, so they're brought on site. And the reason that that is attractive is it's less disturbance to an area like a downtown core, so you're not laying things down and, and taking a lot of space. You, you bring these pieces in and put it up like a puzzle. It erects very quickly, um, 12 pieces a day, up to 40 pieces a day if you're looking at more consistent pieces. So instantaneously with that, that just that little piece of speed, you are closer to revenue much quicker. So that can kind of help that equation for sure. Um, that also would say that all the site, or all, most of the labor for this is then done at the plant. So then you can be eliminating some of these um, other trades or things that have to come in by way of temporary support and scaffolding and things like that. Because when these pieces come in as a precast entity, they're put up and then you can use them right away. I think I have a, is this the little clicker here? I don't know if I'm gonna hit the right button. Oh, that's backwards. 
So this is actually a picture of um, a precast structure going up. And what you can see is it, it's a bunch of pieces, a bunch of concrete pieces that go together like a puzzle. And the fellow standing up there right, right now, he can use that as a workable surface right away compared to other methods like steel erection or cast in place concrete where you have to wait and maybe use other trades. So there is a speed element that I think can really help with construction cost and things penciling out. Um, also, you can put up the precast in adverse weather. So you're not looking to, uh, if, if it's poor weather, some of the process that are involved in cast in place concrete will delay that and then yet yeah, pushes back your schedule, thus pushing back when you can start gaining revenue on those spaces. Um, and that faster revenue generation, the minimized impact on business surrounding, like I said, you bring it in. I mean, those are all advantages that, again, I'm not sure if they're in the equation, but they definitely need to be considered. And especially because if we're looking at responding to the impressions that people have of, it seems like a garage would be a good idea, why aren't we looking at it? So if, if we can make that happen quicker, faster, and make it economical for folks like Dan, then I, th I think it's a solution we should be looking at. Right. So. Let's talk River Park Square. And we've got Roy with us, and he knows more about that than most people. And Roy, what I'd like you to do is just tell us a little bit about that, about that experience, um, and, uh, and, 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 and a little bit about public-private partnerships in general, what you've learned in other communities of the projects you've worked with. Um, sure. And this really is the parking elephant in Spokane. Um, you know, reflecting back, on that project, um, you know, Nordstrom was the first, Spokane Nordstrom was the first out of Seattle Nordstrom uh, in the company. Um, they were brought here because of a relationship that Mayor Jack Garrity had with John Nordstrom. Uh, they were looking to move out of Spokane. If they left, um, the, the Bon Marche, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bon Marche was going to leave. And Spokane would have been um, you know, like Tacoma was 10 or 15 years ago. So Nordstrom said they would stay, um, but they needed parking. So we, we, we started representing the city of Spokane on the parking garage. We ended up withdrawing and representing somebody else. But to me, that project was a very good project. It, it saves Spokane. It's unique in the sense, it's a 1300 stall parking garage, that it's connected to, and I think this is important, connected to River Park Square in that development. So in a way, it sort of has captive parking, but that project cash flows. And we had an arrangement, we formed um, a nonprofit corporation, or what this one Kelly did, which was the right thing to do. Uh, we had a public development authority, um, and we had an arrangement where the, the bonds would be issued by the Public Development Authority, um, and if there was ever any shortfall, the city would um, kick in its parking meter revenues. There was a study done that was presented to the council publicly that the increase in assessed value would more than make up for any shortfall in parking revenues. So the whole thing uh, was structured correctly, but we had a change in government from a, a council manager from a government to a strong mayor from a government, it became a horrible political um, subject. Um, you know, I think it was wrong, but they thought it was unjustly enriching, enriching the Coles family. And we had John Talbot as mayor, uh, who was very much against that. Uh, then we had, jo and that's when the litigation started. Then we had uh, John Power come in and change it a little bit. But that project cash flowed, we understand, from the second year on, and has been very successful. Um, there are ways, and I can talk about a couple of them, and without that project, we wouldn't have had River Park Square. You know, plain, you know that was plain and simple. Uh, it wouldn't have occurred. Do we need the city of Spokane to finance another downtown parking garage? Absolutely not. Um, the thing that's going on now, the Downtown Spokane Partnership formed a nonprofit corporation. You know, we've applied with the Internal Revenue Service for a, a designated purpose of lessening the burdens of government. If, if you yeah, know, that could take three months, six months um, before we get that designation. But 
once we get that, that nonprofit corporation can borrow tax exempt from, an, from a conduit issuer uh, in Seattle, the Washington Economic Development Finance Authority. And some of the things that Gavin mentioned, I uh, work into this really pretty well. I think that it's a, it would be a great opportunity to have a public parking garage uh, not financed by the city of Spokane. And then the city of Spokane could enter into, you know, some of the things that Gavin talked about. You know, they could participate in signage. We could have uniform signage downtown. We could have a, we could develop a whole parking plan where people could, <clears throat> could, um, you know, know where parking is, know where availability is, know where spaces are available. Uh, Gavin mentioned a PDA. That would be another way to help complement a privately owned parking garage. If we financed it uh, the way we're thinking about, if there's a need, and if the feasibility study turns out correctly, you know, at the end of the bond term, that public fa that facility owned by the nonprofit corporation is given to the city of Spokane for free. And it would be obligations to maintain it in a first class condition. But it's a, it's a way communities now are financing things privately. Um, at the end of the bond term, with no city commitment, no, no financial commitment, the city gets it at the, at the end for free. The advantages are, with a public-private partnership, we can cut construction <clears throat> costs by probably 20%. Um, as, as you indicated, we can cut construction time. So a public-private partnership project, and we do these all over the United States right now, uh, compared to a public project, uh, um, we get documented cost savings at 20%. Um, you know, an example that's going to be taking place, we hope, very soon in Spokane, is a guaranteed price contract for the, the, the sports complex, where there'll be, and this is the, the other advantage of a public-private partnership, there are no change orders and no cost overruns that the, that the government or the developer has to pay for. And that's really where the costs come in because you get a contract and then you get change orders and they just escalate. Um, the PFD is looking at a project to put the sports pro the sportsplex with a guaranteed price contract a form of a public-private partnership. We do, we, we do that for parking all over the country. So there is a way um, to do it without City of Spokane revenues pledged to it, directly or indirectly, uh, that would be much less expensive than, than people think it's going to be. The, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't agree with the study. Um, you know, as a business owner downtown, that when we're growing, you know, parking is a really big deal. And we're in a building right now that um, we love, but it doesn't have parking. So when we add new people, uh, we, we're on a waiting list for the parkade. And that doesn't work very well. And I think Spokane is a little bit different than Portland. It's different than Seattle. We have a great transit system, but the population base that we're seeing, at least with our the people that we work with and other people we've talked to, you know, they and, and maybe this is not right, but it's but it's real. They like driving their cars. It, it's one person driving to work, so they have the flexibility of leaving during the day, coming back when they want, having their own parking spot. So I think a parking garage to keep businesses downtown is essential. Yeah, I know some businesses right now who leases are coming up, and they're thinking of going out to the valley. And they're businesses that occupy floors of space and downtown office space. So it's sort of a windy way of saying River Park Square was a political issue, not a financial issue. Uh, I do think that uh, even though there were years of litigation, uh, I think that was absolutely inappropriate. And it did save downtown Spokane. Um, and I commend the Coles for being courageous and hanging through all of that. But without that, again, we would not have what we have now. Um, did we learn lessons? Sure we did. Uh, one lesson would be to do it, you know, differently outside, you know, the city government. 
uh, because we think we, can, we know we can do it faster and less expensive. Do we need it? Uh, it'd be, a, you know, you, you could poll the leasing agents in Spokane, and I think it would be unanimous that we're out of parking. And we need parking to, um, to lease space. You know, we looked at the winter, we looked at the winter, the Wonder Building, I was going to call it the Wonder Bread Building, um, because they had parking. And we, cons and we came, we considered it pretty seriously, but their rental rates were significantly higher than downtown Spokane. And I think part of that is they had adjacent parking, which they were charging a premium for, too. Um, so I think people will pay for parking. I think businesses will. I think we can do it. I know we can do it outside. Uh, the city of Spokane, which make the city happy at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> and all the city would have to do is adopt a resolution that would generally say, um, if you build a downtown parking garage, that would lessen our burden because we wouldn't have to do it with no commitment, direct or indirect, financially. So we're, we're going to move quickly to some other solutions, but I wanted to... Um have Gavin just make a final comment on the on the parking garage. Yeah, I, so I came in in 2003 and we were trying to wrap things up and um, people in this room were involved in that too. Uh, a lot of us were involved in that, but you know, the um, as you look back, I think it was about seven years of litigation and um, I think in 2005 we issued bonds in the amount of $25.2 million and we're paying about $1.8 million per year through 2027 and we don't own the garage <laughs> it was part of the original deal so I, I do think it comes back to leadership and i think the one thing that everybody in this room should pay really att close attention to is that when the administration when the city administration the mayor and the administration are working closely with the city council when you have kind of that integrated leadership these kinds of things won't happen and i think you have to pay really close attention to that and make sure that's happening and i think it's it's really easy to come up with an idea in river park square of course i agree with roy in all respects in terms of what it did for the city um, it was an idea that was um, probably not as broadly shared or, or, or bought into across the population and across the leadership and kind of and, and brought home uh, and it was a pretty desperate situation. We're not in that place now and so um, the, whatever comes forward you want to make sure that that dialogue is occurring um, in great detail and that you want to see city council and the administration working very very closely and in agreement on something like this to avoid that kind of failure in the future. You can keep it on there. Thanks. So, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the parking study mentioned it. We actually have some vendors here who are in this world. But um, collaboration and communication, right? So one of the, one of the questions we received was, said that parking is confusing. Is there any discussion around partnering to centralize parking rates and availability? Anything from a phone number you could call into to get information to a cloud data piece where you could access it on a telephone, I mean on a cell phone, a smartphone. Uh, what's the future look like there? Anyone want to tackle that? or How possible is this collaboration? I'll, I'll just mention financially in terms of the pro formas, again, from the par on-street parking system, it is possible. And that's exactly what we're looking at. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of people in that dialogue, so I'll hand that off. But financially, the city does have that capability to um, potentially underwrite those kinds of proposals. Dan, if, if, we, if we have such collaboration, how far can private parking providers go in sharing proprietary data? Um, you know, reasonably far, but we, we don't, um, we, we don't put everything out there like occupancy and all of that. That's proprietary. But there's there's like a f certain things we could do that would help. And the study did allude to certain things the city of Spokane could do. And that's why a public parking authority may make sense, like Gavin was alluding to. So, so th the private operators can do some, but we need someone carrying the water. Would that be you, Gavin? <laughs> I wasn't going to talk much more, remember? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Andrew, maybe you know this. Are there other cities we ought to be looking to for leadership 
in that kind of collaboration? Are there examples, best practices? Yeah, I mean, the, the study provided quite a few different uh, examples. Um, you know, one from Omaha, for instance. Uh, I think I think it's a good model to template off of because they uh, happen to have winners that uh, you don't have to experience in Seattle, winners like ours. Um, you know, and to get back to the question you just asked, um, you know, there are already a number of platforms that push out information on parking. Um, there's like three or four. Uh, there's one we have. We actually downtown partnership has a platform that provides some limited uh, data. It's not. It's not maintained on a on a daily basis, but uh, there's uh, information uh, that's available uh, through our website. And there's a number, uh, Parkopedia, for instance, is a, a, a web platform that provides information about private facilities. So information is dispersed across a number of different digital platforms. Uh, the, the study is saying that <clears throat> that, that should be unified um, under one f platform. And then, you know, Private operators should be uh, should provide as much information to that uh, as they're comfortable with providing. So there's uh, um, there's a lot of ground to cover, but um, it's it's actually pretty reasonable uh, on that front uh, on what it's suggesting. I think it can be done. It's going to take some time, uh, a year or two, to get there for sure, but uh, uh, eminently feasible. Great, uh, Brandon. There was also a question you may have noticed about integrating or communicating, collaborating with STA services as well. Can you, can you expand on that? <clears throat> we know that more and more people are getting their information uh, from their phones and from mobile devices. And uh, transit trips are no different. So I can't really speak to the uh, parking technology, but I can speak to transit planning technology. So uh, right now, we have four tools in Spokane where you can whip out your phone and plan your trip in real time and know how many minutes away the bus is. Uh, Spokane Transit real time is, is probably uh, among the best because it offers you a, a, a physical location of where the bus is. So just like Uber or Lyft or, or Line Bike where you can see where the vehicle is on a map, you can go to SpokaneTransit.com real time right now and, and pick a route and see where on the route the bus is. That's really valuable to people who want access to information. Uh, we. When we don't have information, we're anxious and we want to know, did I miss the bus that already come? So that, re that kind of removes that anxiety. Uh, Google Maps is using real-time data from Spokane Transit, so you can plan your trips through Google Maps. A lot of people plan their, plan their car trips. All you have to do is change the icon to the transit button, uh, and it'll plan your trip for you. Uh, Transit app and Move It are both apps that are here in the Spokane market. And One Bus Away, which is what the DSP annual speaker uh, spoke about um, a few months ago, uh, we're, we're in talks with them to try to, to get that uh, online here in Spokane soon. Uh, we're also looking at um, mobility sharing. So as uh, Lime Bike and Lime Scooters are ever present, uh, we're looking at what are the creative ways transit can meet the needs of the first and last mile trips. So are there ways for those uh, vehicles to be co-located with high transit ridership areas uh, to make sure that we're extending the network of the pedestrian. Uh, transit is a, a network of pedestrians, and um, they can go further with some of these other tools. So we're, we are looking at ways that, that, that we can extend that. There was a, there was a question somewhere in there about how uh, we, have, we have park and rides in, smart, in the suburbs and, and outside of the, the core. What about a structure or parking lot at the edge of the core? The folks who then use other intermodal like the, the line bike, uh, scooters, mm -hmm. uh, and such. How possible is that? Yeah. I would be remiss if I also didn't mention our entire uh, fair technology restructure. So we're in the in the midst of planning to be able to pay for your transit fare with your phone, uh, and we're, we're, so we're looking, and also to be able to manage your online transit account um, through a web portal. So basically, logging in to pay your transit fare, keep it on your phone, um, and then you'd be able to flash your phone with a with a um, validator when you get on the on the bus. Uh, so really, just trying to streamline that. In terms of how we're planning mobility share. Our first and primary focus is to move people from their homes to their final destination, and that is the vast majority of our trips. We don't necessarily plan for people to use their car first and then. So first priority is to get people from their home to their destination. But we do recognize there is a small segment of our, of our ridership who want their cars for a portion of their trip. So we do have 14 different park and ride locations throughout the system, including the Jefferson lot in downtown, which has about 400 and something stalls. Uh, we're always looking at creative solutions for how we can um, meet the needs of the people in the region 
but also be as efficient as possible. So um, the great thing with the city ticket, which is the kind of shuttle system on the on the north bank, we have a great partnership with the PFD and through Diamond Parking with, with PFD um, as the operator of the lot. We also have uh, the DSP as the promoter of the program, and then you have Spokane Transit who provides the service. Um, when you have that combination of partnership, it, it makes something like that make a lot more sense. Um, to look at something like that in other parts of the downtown area, we would be looking for those that same combination of partnerships. Who is the operator? We know that there's been curiosity about parking operations underneath I-90, um, but now you're getting into lease discussions with Washtot, with the city of Spokane, uh, and, and, and so we, we just have to look for those opportunities. Are there locations under I-90 that work with our existing routes that have the operator? Uh, does do the stars align and so that's what we're going to continue working with dsp and other partners on thank you so uh we started a little bit late perhaps you couldn't find parking out front <laughs> but so maybe mark will give us a couple extra minutes i'm going to get to your questions we have some questions here but i'd like to ask uh, melissa first to add to the multimodal uh, anything more you've got uh you'd like to add on that piece and, and then i've got a land use it question there for everyone um, I guess just to kind of reiterate what I said before, um, being a bike commuter for many, many years, um, I was really fortunate that my company had a place to put my bike. I'm not quite sure I would have done that if I had to leave it outside. I mean, so that's a real thing, too. Uh, also, with the, the bike lanes are, are labeled, but it's really only in the core. So coming from one location and getting there is usually life in your own hands and try to figure it out. So I think we need to, or it would be helpful to expand that. And then also, like I said before, there just isn't the culture here yet to accept bikes on the road. And yet when you go on the sidewalk, then the security throws you off the sidewalk. So we're kind of this in this gray area. If you, if you want to be a commuter, um, how do you make that happen? How do you try to follow the rules, but how does it stay safe? I always said, I, I, I bike to work to be healthy, not to be killed. So I kind of I kind of want to look for solutions to to making that a more safe option out there. All right, thank you. So uh, we're in the process of a new downtown Spokane plan, right, or modifying one that had been done before. Um, what role does a city in that kind of land use planning, zoning, incentives, and so forth? What role does that does that play in addressing the parking issue? Anyone want to tackle that? Uh, whether it's um, it's uh, requiring parking, whether it's uh, uh, changing the rules that we currently have concerning parking and, and building structures. Uh, what do we do? If we're rewriting that plan today, how do we modify it to help solve the problem we're talking about today? Yeah, it's a combination of, of two things that are mentioned in the study. Um, so on the one hand, the study recommends that the uh, zero parking requirement zone uh, that currently overlays the downtown core actually be expanded. So uh, that would uh, drive pressure on, on the demand for parking uh, by allowing uh, for developers to, uh, to develop um, commercial buildings, residential mixed use buildings, uh, and not have to provide parking in a larger area than, than where we're at right now. So again, it, it, it suggests that we expand the no parking required or, or the, the parking minimum zone further out. Um, but it recognizes that uh, it's going to uh, that in and of itself is going to cause some negative effects, and we're actually talking about that right now. The the reality of how uh, there are a number of projects across downtown that that got to the point of becoming reality because they didn't have to include parking. So that, that's that's on the one hand that the, the scale uh, is balanced out as a study suggests by. Um, allowing developers to get engaged in in this parking loop under a number of, of sort of creative ways to uh, provide more options uh, than just building parking right at their own facility so uh, that that's how uh, so they, they recommend building this uh, building a fund uh, that they can take in revenue from a number of different sources including possibly the the developer uh, him or herself who uh, would um, 
you know, put apply money to that fund that would otherwise have to go to a parking structure, uh, and and again going through that list of of options. So option one might be well, there are several other developments in this area that are being built. Uh, soon we can we can partner and build a, a parking facility. Uh, realistic or unrealistic depends on the situation. The next step down from that would be to um, have funds available for uh, the development of of alternatives to parking. So. Um, you know, bicycling or transit systems or wayfinding, uh, and then working their way down that list. And and this this study suggests that 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 is going. Those processes are going to actually have to be worked out in in the part in the downtown plan update. Um, so more to follow on that, and more opportunity for the community in, to engage on um, what it wants to prioritize as as the, the strategies that work best for uh, downtown. So others, uh, if you're rewriting the downtown plan, how would you how would you change it, Brandon? I, I just wanted to focus really quickly on the relationship between land use and transportation and, and what we can be doing. Spokane Transit is working closely with the uh, with the city of Spokane on our central city line overlay district. Um, we did an economic impact study of that project early on that showed that over the course of 20 to 30 years that that has a potential to raise economic development value in the core by 100. $75 million, and that was without additional incentives. And so there are opportunities um, for land use to, l for economic opportunities in land use to leverage the transit investment. Um, this is one of the best, uh, most robust transit investments that our community has ever seen. And uh, the opportunity for that level of frequency provides an opportunity for, for to to create high density development without the requirement of, of, of additional parking. Uh, so so we're going to be continuing to work with the city of Spokane can to see how we can leverage um, leverage that project in downtown. And I would just echo what Andrew said. You, do, you don't want to mess with demand downtown. I mean, demand is your friend, even though it's a pain point. It's kind of a classic chicken or the egg kind of thing. And we're at this pain point right now where I think these pro formers really are about to balance. And so really, I think focusing your attention on some way to balance that pro forma, you know, there's just so many different ways, you know, again, property tax, uh, uh, exemptions, a sales tax exemption or an allocation of sales tax and a revenue sharing through a public development authority. There's a lot of ways you could bring just enough dollars to balance these pro formas and the last thing you want to do is stifle demand at this point. Great. Thanks. So we've got a couple of questions here. We're going to, we're about out of time, but we're going to try to bust through a couple of them. Uh, first one is, will increasing the, the cost of downtown parking discourage people visiting downtown? Um, I'm assuming that's a um, on-street parking question, but I don't know for sure. Well, I would just mention, you know, the whole viability of downtown is about the experience of downtown. So there's a lot of people contributing to the experience of downtown. But when you've got the, uh, there's Jonathan over there running Riverfront Park and you're dropping, you know, 70 plus million, I think it's actually larger than that with the utilities contributions to, into the park. And you're going to be blown away by what's, say, for instance, going on in the U.S. Pavilion. We, we're not even there yet on this contribution of, uh, of Riverfront Park. When you spend uh, over 200 million to clean up the river, when you, that CSO 26, that's going to blow people's minds across from the library when we finish opening up. Uh, Spokane Falls Boulevard, but the experience of downtown, uh, Kendall Yards in general, the experience of downtown is absolutely critical to this demand, and so I think uh, that's the direction we need to really focus on there. Um, as, as far as increasing the price, I definitely hate paying for parking myself. That is part of the reason I also bike. But I think if the price goes up, then that is more incentive for alternative modes of transportation. And so if, if we are going to increase prices, we definitely need to look at how can we make ulterior modes more friendly as well. You know, and on the, on the question of whether uh, raising on street rates will affect customer um, a customer response, yes, it will. There, there are certainly people who will hear that and, and make the decision not to come to downtown, but I think, Dan, you said it earlier in the presentation that convenience uh, also drives um, a customer response, too. So there's the price signal but then the, that repels, and then there's the convenience signal that, it, that attracts, and, and that's what 
um, you know, making a decision to roll out the new pricing is about is to generate the the signal that that you know is uh, it, it's not an easy or, or a happy answer, but it is going to to cause people to make the decision to um, you know move into off street parking facilities. It gets us that much closer on a pro forma that works for a garage, uh, and you know, and 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 I think it makes a, a good difference the, between driving around and around and around right now versus ensuring that there are probably a couple three spots on the street that are available for, for those that uh, are willing to pay for it. On-street parking really should be uh, for the customer. Right now, we've got a system that's so heavily subsidized for on-street parking that it, it's an awful lot of employees who are parking, maybe myself as recently as last week. But um, yeah, it, it's a real thing, and, and it will affect customer behavior. Um, but it, it has uh, it has some upsides, and, and you know it's up to the city council to make a decision on how rapidly that's rolled out. They could make the decision that we're going to jump up prices in uh, you know two months, a uh, dollar fifty beyond where it's at right now. I seriously doubt that they would actually make that decision. I, I think they're going to they're going to ease into it. Uh, Dan, my friend. Yes. I believe this is yours. If the city increases the rate of street parking, will Diamond raise their rates? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> there you have it. Yeah, we would tend to follow what whatever they do. But we, or let me back up. We, we set the rates based upon what the market will bear. So when you were talking about the on-street spaces, and I, and I keep talking about the ones by River Park Square. That's the premium parking. People, from my experience, will pay for that. But it, what also from my experience, if we charge too much, the people won't come. So we know that, too. So it's a fine balance. So did I answer your question? Well, well it's not my question. <laughs> okay, whose question was that? Anyway, well... We're going to go with his first answer. Yes, but we we tend to set the rates for what the market will bear. Okay, thank they you. were not subsidized, so we have to let the free market dictate. And Gavin, I, this may be a loaded question, but how much did the study cost? That's a, that probably is a loaded question, but I'm not. Come on. <laughs> I'm not one hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars. Uh, one more on parking. Sorry, there's a lot of words here. Okay, as more people move to Spokane and the demand for downtown housing increases, is it time to demand that developers add parking uh, to new multifamily residential projects? That's a land use question, right? I think Andrew kind of answered yeah, that. But maybe there's an opposing no, viewpoint no. on that. I, I think, I, yeah, I think, the, I think the, well, I think the simple answer is, is no. Um, you know, if you, if you add that demand and, and pro formas break apart, uh, you know, downtown is a place that, that wants and that needs, uh, you know, complex, multi-use, mixed-use development. And, um, you know, that's a decision that, uh, that tends to push that away and it makes uh, developing in the valley that much more attractive. So, um, you know, I, I, th this gets right back to the controversy around parking garages because there are plenty of cities that have made a determination that parking kind of functions like a utility uh, and that, that municipalities are best suited to, to building that. Um, and, you know, the city's got some history around parking uh, garage development that we're trying to actually work on right now, right at this, uh, this very panel. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna continue to take some time to to get through that to get to get to that point and while we are still working on as as a community getting comfortable with revisiting public private partnerships of all type of all types we we do need to uh, also be working on the closer in easier uh frankly easier solutions uh like what what i described when we when i went through the through the study itself you know in a public parking garage doesn't, when I was talking to Melissa earlier, does not have to be a concrete box. I think there's a way to take a public parking garage, infuse retail on the ground floor, and have it be actually, in addition to, to providing public parking, be a economic contributor to the city. Obviously, the city is in the mode of encouraging downtown housing um, in every way we possibly can. 
Yeah, that's that's definitely true, Roy. You can you can develop these garages now, and we're seeing them done where the garage is, say, a central part of the structure, and then outside of it can be retail space or residential or office space. So it doesn't even look like a garage, and that even works into the safety of that space as well. If you're not needing to leave and walk away, that's where you just go get your car. So there are a lot of options. There's a lot of options with precast. There's a lot of options with glazing. There's a lot of things you can do to make these not look like just a concrete box that you walk up to and walk away from. So we're, uh, we're late, and I'm sorry, Mark. <laughs> so uh, first of all, uh, please uh, join me in thanking a wonderful panel uh, who did a lot of work ahead of time and, uh, and I think did a great job tonight of uh, answering questions. <laughs> Before I, before I hand it back to, to Mark, uh, a couple takeaways. One is um, the, the, the study really did have a lot of recommendations, and it sounded to me like there's a lot of opportunity for us to peck away at those. There's perhaps even some funding available for us to start pecking away at those. Um, we learned that there's a um, difference of opinion about the supply of parking, and uh, perhaps that's about what exactly you want as a parker, whether you're an, an employee or not. Um, structures are possible and the financing for those structures is possible not just with the traditional public-private partnership but with some other options um, available to us now and that collaboration is really critically needed um, amongst our uh, parking vendors with the city and others to make sure that we all uh, so the parking isn't as confusing as one questioner said we gotta we have to reduce the confusion make parking a little bit easier for everyone so uh, those are the takeaways that I uh, picked up. I know that you have some as well. Um, DSP is very, very interested in, um, in, in, in elongating this discussion, right? So um, don't let us stop here. We had, a, we had a great conversation, but the conversation needs to continue, and they are there. They are the mechanism, I believe, for us to have that conversation in the future. So don't be shy. Uh, they will be following up with the questions we didn't get a answered today. Uh, so if you did submit one, uh, they will be responding. So thank you very much. Excellent job. How about a, uh, a specific thank you to our moderator, Paul. Thank you so much. Great job. A couple of additional kudos I want to pass out. I want to thank our media partner for those folks who didn't recognize or see Vinny hiding behind that pole there and that stealth camera. Uh, Spokane Talks Media is a great partner of ours. They should be a partner of yours. Um, consider using them. They do a phenomenal job and their, their exposure continues to grow every single day. So thank you, Vinny. I uh, want to thank the Montville Center and Sammy in particular, I think, that we worked with. I want to thank, I think it's Rachel with Lake, Lake Catering who provided the food tonight. And then I want to thank also our, our um, booths, our vendors in the back, uh, STA, which I missed first time around, Lime, Avista, and Spot Hero. Uh, we have a little bit more time here. We actually have this space until 7. Our goal was is to encourage you to stick around, have a cocktail, and continue to talk about these issues. Uh, we hope that you do that. And, uh, uh, but if you don't, um, or even if you do, please, uh, one of the things, as Paul mentioned, it's really important to us is for th that we learn from the survey that's on your table. So continue to provide your feedback, not only about parking, but also about this event, how we can improve this engagement and this dialogue. And, uh, and, then, and then I would just say stick around, stay informed, and stay connected with us. We also have an e-news we, we shoot out. We have a great, robust website with, uh, that promotes all of the things that Downtown Spokane Partnership does at downtownspokane.com. Uh, org. And then we also have, uh, again, like I said, an e-news that keeps you up to date on all the happenings in downtown. Um, so would would be uh, great, very grateful as an organization and on behalf of our employees for you uh, continuing to stay engaged in your downtown. Uh, I, I almost missed, I think they might have skipped out, but our, our ambassador team that was here tonight with the SEPTED program. This is a very intentional program. We're partnering with a number of different partners on. Again, hope that you take advantage of that. Take that home back to your property managers or to your property and think about ways that, that uh, we can engage and support you in making sure that your property is safe, make sure that your parking is safe and accessible for your employees. So uh, with that, I just want to thank you on behalf of uh, my employees. I want to thank Kelly uh, Blythe in the back for uh, really coordinating and orchestrating this entire event. 
and my entire team. Uh, have a beautiful night. Stick around, have a cocktail, have some food with us, and let's talk more about parking. Thank you. Thank you.